This is another episode of Not a Strong Start, a podcast by filmmakers who talk movies, television, and do part two of show episodes. I'm your host, 12 Years of Dan. Um, Shape of My Bird Man. And I am Forever Parasite J. Forever, forever. So forever. <laughs> in last week's episode, we went through, we ranked uh, our movie, our the last Oscar movie, the last 10 years, we ranked number 10 through number six. In this week's episode, we're going to be talking about number five through number one. So who comes in at number one? Is anyone's guess? We don't know. Could be Parasite. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We'll see. Don't jump you know, to the end. <laughs> yeah, don't jump to the end. <laughs> Going into the next one, at number five, we have uh, Green Book. Uh, Green Book, I believe that was from 2019. Uh, that can be found on... Uh, actually, it's not streaming right now uh basically it's like you've got this world-class sophisticated african-american pianist who hires this like tough from the bronx fast talking not sophisticated at all like italian american to basically drive him around and be his protection as he embarks on a tour through the deep south in the 60s uh which it's probably not the best idea at that point in time. Uh, this uh, was directed by uh, Peter Far Farley, but it's weird because this is so different that you look at his backlog of, of directed movie. You have Shallow Hal, Dumb and Dumber, Something About Mary, Me, Myself, and Irene, um, Kingpin, and then you have like Green Book. Uh, so... We'll start with uh, you on this one, George. What was your thoughts on Green Book? Uh, yeah, I guess it shows what, like this half of the Farley brothers for me is possibly the talent. Granted, I don't know. I haven't seen the other brother do anything by himself. Uh, but I liked the Green Book a lot, honestly. For me, this is almost like a return to form for him in filmmaking because I love those earlier films from the 90s. Mm -hmm. I felt as they started progressing, they kind of got weak and they lost their allure. But this, I thought this was a, a great character piece for the two of them, for the two characters of, uh, was it Dr. Shirley and Tony the Lip? Mm. I, I love their, the growing of their friendship. Like there's this driving Miss Daisy odd couple thing. Mm. That, you know, that's what it really is at the end of the day. Yeah. And I, I liked, because I like the idea of friendship and all that kind of stuff. And it, it tackles a hard subject of, you know, the, that time where the black people are still dealing with oppression and not being allowed to go in certain places. And that's what the green book was. The green book was that, that line that you can tote without having to worry about your butt being killed pretty much while being in the South. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but no, I like, I liked everything that they, that they went through everything. There's some funniness to it. There's definitely a bit of laughs, but there's also, it's again, it's dealing with hard things. Like I, I didn't know too much of the backstory of these characters. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know it was a surprise when it turned out that, Dr. Shirley also was a homosexual and mm -hmm. him having to hide that. And then this, uh, was it Fr Tony's, I was going to call him Frank for some reason, but Tony, Tony, Tony just being accepting it. Like he doesn't judge him at all, but he's just like, yo, be a little careful, dude. <laughs> like what's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I liked all of that. And even at the very end when like they have like their dinner together and that it, the acceptance, I thought that was all really nice. But like, I think one of my favorite shots is just them driving down like a strip. And you see on the side, there's still like some black folk like working in the fields. They're still like they're free, but they're not really free. They're still mm -hmm. a caged in here, you, you know, and through society. And he doesn't have to live that life. You know, he lives in New York where he lives like on the top floor of a building and he's mm -hmm. he lives a really cushy life. And he doesn't understand like he understands, but he doesn't have to live that what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And just seeing like the parallels and how he has to like try to weave his way through it, I thought was it was very impactful, very emotional. But I would watch this again. Like I was very entertained by everything. This is despite mm -hmm. the heavy subject matter, there's loads of entertainment in here. Green Book I actually ranked around this spot. I had a number five, but Green Book, I actually held off on watching it for a long time, and I only watched it for the first time during for this episode. And the reason why I held off was because it feels very Oscar Beatty. So like, <laughs> that's why you made yeah. this movie. It's another white man saving black man again and being the savior. It felt very vanilla while trying to tackle something that's supposed to be really deep. So for those reasons, I was just like, I've seen this so many times and it's just, no, 
I, I don't think I'm going to get anything new out of this. So I just kind of held off on watching it. Then I watched it. And even though the story is kind of what, what I thought it was in a way, the actors are so good. They're so good. They made me care. And even when you said, George, about how he's driving by and you see them still working out in the field, it was deep. But the thing about this movie is that it feels very like uh, it feels like it was orchestrated from white Hollywood making a movie about the subject matter while not totally depicting white people as the villain. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, like, yeah. It was written by the son, I believe, it, it, of of the Tony the Lips character. OK, OK. Yeah, so, so I think that's why. Yeah, so exactly. So so that's kind of how it felt. They didn't go to the true ugliness of it. Ali did such a good performance in this as well as Viggo Mortensen. But it was so even when you mentioned like the ending, you know, where he kind of comes in for dinner and they just kind of accept them. I'm glad that's what the family did, but it still didn't. I, I don't know how, how to really describe it. It just seemed too vanilla and safe and it didn't really get the true ugliness of how ugly uh, racist Americans, white people were during that time. They didn't really show us that. And maybe it's because they felt we've seen it too much. I don't know. But the subject matter you're tackling is very ugly. And it still didn't. Other than him going to the restaurant, right? And, oh, we're not going to serve you. We're not going to serve you. And then him just trying to tip Viggo Mortensen and take him out. Like, that's it? Like, that's all we got? Well, like, we it would have been a lot too. uglier. Huh? Yeah. There's, there's a the bar scene scenes. and then the cops. No, no. Uh, so there was a few moments. No, no. There were. But but I'm just saying in real times, it was way uglier than that. And he would have seen beaten. it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> we we would have seen it depicted uglier. That's why I felt like they just went a little too vanilla with it. That, that was my only thing on it. But the actors were so good. With this one, I I did enjoy it. Um, I think what you're saying then was one of the reasons I kind of ranked this higher overall. Uh, so the over subject of him going through the South and what he was going to have to deal with uh, is it, tough. But I kind of like that the movie didn't over-focus on that because this movie was about the relationship of the two leads and that symbiotic relationship between both of them. I had the same thoughts when I first saw that. I didn't see the Green Book when it first came out. I just saw that last month in preparation for this, for that same reason. I was like, I don't want to see another white savior movie in this. <laughs> but then when I watched it, I didn't get that. I saw it more as a symbiotic relationship between them where they were both helping each other grow yeah. as an individual. So he was helping him with protection and kind of letting him loosen up a little bit and accepting him. But then he was also, you know, helping, you know, Tony and and making him grow as a person and even how he interacted with his wife and the family and all of that. So I didn't feel it was just one person saving the other. It was just more about their budding relationship and how they were each helping each other be better uh, overall. Uh, so that was like how my preconceived notion kind of changed a little bit as I was watching it. Uh, I felt it was a good mix of of, of comedy overall, uh, you know, beginning to end, even with that tough background of the situation that was going on. Uh, you know, and it was that clash of two different worlds uh, overall. Uh, so I, I, I enjoyed it overall. I feel the entertainment uh, factor was there. Uh, the two leads were unbelievable in their in their performance. Uh, the chemistry was there. Uh, <laughs> I can watch a uh, Tony the Lip movie. Uh, just like yeah. his character <laughs> yeah. uh, was really entertaining, and you know he was uh, he was a dick without being a dick fully. So yeah. if that makes any sense, but uh, overall, that, those are my thoughts on the Green Book. Yeah. So. Uh, going on to the next one, at number four from 2016, we have Spotlight. Uh, Spotlight can be found on HBO Max. Uh, basically, it follows a group of Boston journalists who they get assigned uh, basically to investigate allegations of, um, of molestation of boys by the Boston church, uh, a priest specifically. Uh, it's directed by Tom McCarthy. 
Uh, we'll start with you on this one, Dan. What were your thoughts on Spotlight? I know you mentioned earlier uh, it's <clears> not your type of movie. <laughs> okay, so originally I didn't know what I had to do with with the cat, you know, with uh, the priests. I thought it was still just like another political thing, but they all look so similar in their trailers and stuff that it's, in my opinion, it's kind of easy to kind of group them all together because they all look alike. So I just kind of thought it was the same, but I actually enjoyed this one more than Argo and I had it higher up on my list and it had Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton is so good. <laughs> just as an actor in general, he really shines in this movie, but then you have Mark Ruffalo who's really good in it. And it's that scrappy underdog newspaper that's trying to break the story and it goes deeper and deeper. So I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to. And it has a little more of a higher rewatchability for me. So it's one that I'll probably end up going back and, and watching again. I watched it in preparation for this episode, but it was good, man. And they tackled the subject matter that was that, that was interesting. And we all knew, you know, when this stuff came out and stuff. So just really good overall. It, it was shot well. It was made well, technically. Um Again, really, the casting, I think, really carried this movie for me um, because the dialogue and stuff was solid. It wasn't like I had bad writing or anything, but the characters, they they casted really good actors that really know how to deliver these lines. And they added so much character to how they do it that I thought sometimes I just sat back and I just watched um, Michael Keaton just cook. Sometimes like I just want to see yeah. this guy act. Let him man. cook, like, man. Let him, let him cook, cook yeah. man. Like, he was good. He was Chef RD in the kitchen, yeah. man. He was tossing so it up. Funny. That's it, man. He was good. So overall, Spotlight was solid, man. So if if that falls in line with those type of movies, then in my opinion, this is one of the better ones. Because this one I, I really enjoyed. So I would recommend it to people that like those type of movies. Solid. Yeah, this, this for me was like a great dramatization documentary mm -hmm. kind of film. You know, because mm -hmm. we were like, we're me and Jose are from the Boston area. I definitely remember when this all happened and everything. And this felt like I was getting the back door into how this all went down. Like it felt so real. Like I felt like I was in that newsroom with them trying to investigate and figure everything out, you know. And even like there's there's small little things that you didn't really need, but it added to like like Mark Ruffalo's character dealing with the fact he's not with his wife and his job like he's so dedicated to his job and getting to the bottom of this that that's putting that strain on that relationship you know and you get that by where he's living and he doesn't have much but he's just like he's just so dedicated to get to the bottom of the story it almost felt like someone who had like a, a learning disability like you know it like, can Jose probably relate to this with his job or the, when you used to have we're dealing with like kids who have Asperger's or ADHD or something kind of like that he's just fixated this is what he has to do. This is what he knows. You know, there's something relative to that, I felt. And I, I felt that's what he had almost at times. And I loved it. It's like, just help. The, just give the kid what he wants. Come on, man. <laughs> and it's like, he was, he's, he's only like five minutes late. Get, let him, let him have the information. <laughs> but like, I, I, I think it's probably one of my favorite performances from Ruffalo, honestly, from everything I've ever seen him in. I, I thought he, he freaking was phenomenal. But like mm -hmm. you said to like Michael Keaton. It's you forget this guy was a comedian. Like this was a guy was a zany comedian who played Beetlejuice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. <laughs> Beetlejuice. And like, and with that ending, like with the end, like finding out, it's like, holy snap, you're the guy. Like there was a sense of it's a uh, suspense and intrigue and like mystery that I didn't anticipate from it, also. Cause the whole thing you're watching, wondering like who's the guy that was at spotlight who is keeping this this information from getting out? Mm -hmm. Who is the one? And, I, and for a while, I'm thinking, like, it's the other guy, uh, the, the, the white-haired actor. I can't remember his freaking name now. I think oh, I had it written Mad down Man? somewhere. Huh? Yeah. The one from Mad Men. The guy Man. from Mad Men? Yeah, 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 him, yeah. Uh, John Sat Slatley. Uh, him. I thought for a while he was going to be the guy. And then when you find out Michael Keaton the whole time is the reason this story wasn't figured out earlier, I was like, oh, snap! <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, I, I didn't anticipate to, to get that fully invested into this kind of film because, like you, Dan, it's like, it feels too political. It feels too too much newsy and stuff. But it's like, okay, you got me. I'm I'm, I'm in it. I, I want to mm -hmm. know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, it was, it's, it was very stressful, actually, mm -hmm. just going through it. Like, I felt the stress that they were all going mm -hmm. through. You know, yeah. and that's important when the movie can make you feel what the actors are feeling. As it should. That That's correct filmmaking like you're yeah. supposed to put us right there with your actors and your characters we're supposed to be feeling that kind of pressure and they did masterful job this was a movie i watched at the time just on the all-star cast uh just on that alone i'm like all right i have to i have to see this see what this is about uh overall and you know 
it is an all-star cast. You don't get a bad performance from anyone in that all-star cast. That being said, I feel personally while I was watching it that Mark Ruffalo and Rachel McAdams kind of stole the show uh, over on that movie. They they had some of the stronger scenes acting wise uh, in that movie overall that stuck out stuck stuck out the most. And again, everyone did a great job in it, so it's not like they were the only good ones. But I don't know is because my expectations for them in this all-star cast maybe wasn't as high as the other one, but they just really stuck out in their performance uh, overall, especially Rachel McAdams. Mm -hmm. uh, but the movie was good. It just, it did a good job of showing the level of effect like that those incidents had on the community and the difficulty of having to investigate something that goes against the church in Boston at the time and they did a good job of portraying that overall this wasn't an easy investigation or easy story for them there was a lot of obstacles they had to go through and that's the you know the stress level that george was talking about this movie portrayed that very well in that way um and even the investigation aspects itself they felt real uh i believe these were journalists kind of going through these steps and these were characters that were, they were not perfect. They're not, they're not those, sometimes you get those journal journalists in movies, they just get everything right and always find a way to get the answer and they're flawless. Not these journalists. You see them kind of fumble through all this and struggle through. Yeah. And I think that added to the authenticity of the entire thing, uh, which mm -hmm. lets me really enjoying this movie. Going on to number three, uh, I guess we'll stay on the key and kick, uh, but at, <laughs> number three, at number three from 2015, we have Birdman. Uh, mm. This you can currently find on HBO Max uh, streaming. Uh, basically, the, the premise of it is you have this former uh, superhero actor uh, who's trying to put on the Broadway play that he uh, adapted directing and is acting in it uh, because if he feels that you know it'll bring credibility uh, to his career and him as an artist and that's the basic premise of this movie um, it's directed and I'm probably going to butcher the last name by Alejandro Iñataris Iñataro Iñarato 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 also known for the Revenant <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Also knows for the Revenant. I think this is how you take a thing that's like Birdman is an old cartoon from Hannah and Mabara, if people who aren't aware, all right? If you're a fan of that and you thought you were going to get that going into this, boy, were you wrong. <laughs> is that what you thought coming into uh, this? No, no, no. I knew what I was getting. <laughs> I knew what I was getting from the trailer. Okay. But with that, this is what I feel like. If you want to take on a classic thing like that, a good example, Velma just came out. Not the best depiction of a Scooby Doo gang thing. This is how you take something old like that and reinvent it for someone brand new, or even someone who's old, because this is definitely older character, older actors and everything. And it, it gives it its own brand new voice while still kind of in some way respecting the the source material. You know, very there's not much reference to, to Birdman really in this whole thing. It's really just about the actor <laughs> and what he's going through in his life. But this is such a like it's it's an entertaining artsy film without feeling pretentious at all. You know, if anything, I feel like it pokes fun at pretentiousness at times, especially when you have like Edward Norton's character who felt like he was just actually being Edward Norton at times mm -hmm. as opposed to being an actor. <laughs> I thought that was great. Like it actually made me respect Edward Norton again. It's like, all right, you know that you're making fun of yourself right now. Yeah. You're fully yeah. aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you're just being that guy. Self parody. Yeah. yeah. And I loved all of that. You know, like I like how it just like played with all that stuff and like how uh Michael Keaton's character is dealing with this craziness around him and trying to like keep it all contained. And at, at times, like I remember watching a trailer, I was like, oh wait, so is Birdman real or is he crazy? What's going on? And watch the movie, I still felt it. I still <laughs> at times I was questioning, it's like, what's happening here? What's yeah. going to happen? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was like, the director. I don't think he's made one film that's like the other. Mm, no, they're very, it's different. very impressive. Like each yeah. film has its own voice 
And it's almost hard to believe he's the same director. Yeah. Of all the films he's done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This this one is, despite it on my list being at number three, and that's number three on this list, I think it has high rewatchability. Huge. Honestly. Mm -hmm. Like this, this one also was like surprised it won an Oscar because this is not the one that usually wins. Not something like this. And the fact that Michael Keaton's getting that, that light, Mm -hmm. it's like, I'm, I'm blown away by it. Yeah. And another star-studded cast. There's a lot of freaking stars in this one. Yeah, so this one actually ha- uh, had a number two. I'm actually surprised it's not higher because I thought some of you guys would have it as number one or number two. Um, but it's phenomenal. So if I said, uh, you know, he was Chef Bardee in the last movie, in this one he was Wolfgang Puck. Like, he <laughs> crushed this role. <laughs> he crushed this role, uh, though. And it's I love it because it's sort of like a where Michael Keaton's career could have gone because it's sort of like... Birdman, Batman, and you know yeah. they played a similarity. You know they played into that. And it, 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 so when you said you were surprised that it won, I'm not surprised because it still played within the play world. You still had actors, right? So you still had like an ode to Hollywood in a sense. And you still had a character piece like you did with No Man Land. You still dealt with deranged and crazy. But you and then you casted uh, Michael Keaton who's like old royalty in terms of Hollywood. So I can see why it won, but it definitely deserved it. I was definitely cheering it on. And they have a lot of things, like you said, is where it's kind of open to interpretation. It was so artistic in how they filmed things. They had a lot of good one shots that they would, you know, track along with it. So the filmmaking was impeccable. I thought, uh, I thought he did such a phenomenal job with it, but Emma Stone, man, Emma Stone was good in this movie. She was so Edward Norton was good in this movie, Michael Keaton, but even the memorable scene where he's naked and he's running around when he's outside and everybody's <laughs> filming it. They had iconic moments for this. And even when you see him and you see them just floating, <laughs> just flying in the air, floating, like levitating. So many good things, man. And when he's talking to him as Birdman, again, it could have been an alternate reality where if Michael Keaton's career died after Batman, you could see this being his life. And other actors that ha- used to have one iconic thing and then their careers died, it looks like a very realistic parallel to that and how the ego is driven and causes insanity because you're believing your own hype and you think you're better off than what it is. And him telling he should actually shoot himself in the play, like just really good, man. I loved it. I th- it was very uh, artistic, but the Birdman or the type of movie like that's I'm the target audience for Birdman, <laughs> not not Argo. Birdman, like, <laughs> yes, you got me all day. You have a stylistic voice. You have a different story of something I haven't seen. I love character-driven pieces. And then you're playing around with insanity and you give me some surrealism. Uh, that's that's me all day, man. Like, I love that kind of stuff. So Birdman was absolutely in the, in the wheelhouse. And off the movies that were coming before Birdman, I wasn't impressed with the movies that kept winning i'm like yeah those movies are good but eh, like man like they don't have a lot of high rewatchability when birdman came out i was like man i loved birdman i loved me some birdman when it came out and i've seen it a few times and it was just it was really well done i loved it i will say i just want to tack on to that i would i almost would slightly argue this was his resurgence uh, who because Michael Keaton? He, yeah, because Michael Keaton did fall off for a bit. No, he did. What you what know? I'm saying is Hollywood loves them a redemption story like John Travolta. Yeah, yeah. when John yeah, yeah, Travolta yeah. bounced up, that's what I'm saying because this he's is, old this was Hollywood. Yeah, yes, this was that for him when he came out with this spotlight. Like he had his resurgence. That's why I felt like I can see it, just like Brendan Fraser with the whale. Yeah, they're waiting for the rebound and they're gonna give you all the your flowers and the love. You just gotta come with the right project that does like self-humiliation in a way if you can self-humiliate yeah. you know yourself right there on camera you're gonna do a good job bouncing back i enjoyed the heck out of uh <laughs> out of birdman uh overall um you know you guys already spoke in the performance so i won't get too much into it but everyone you know edward norton was great as an a-hole and michael keaton absolutely killed his performance uh directing itself they did a really good job uh you know as you mentioned dan with the with the one shots and 
how they did it. We've seen that go horribly wrong for many movies. This is one of those mm-hmm. situations where it went, it went right. Uh, you know, coming from a theater background, I did theater all as a kid through high school, through college. Uh, this is something that I can I can relate to the theater aspect. So seeing them there rehearsing and backstage and doing all that, it just started bringing back like all these old memories of like being in theater and kind of going through these steps and the headaches that come with with some of these aspects. Uh, so I think that definitely increased the entertainment value for me as I uh, I was able to relate to it. You know, and this was also, it also, it felt refreshing at the time. One, because um, it seemed different than what normally wins for the Oscars. The, yeah. You know, we're also at that time and still we're in this age of uh, superhero movies that are like dominating everything. And this did it differently. You know, this was uh, from the perspective of any of those actors playing superhero uh characters you know what if that's all they had and they finished doing that and their struggle with like i'm only thought of as a superhero like am i credible of do people respect me as an artist or they just look at me at this character and like hey he's good for laughs and entertainment and i can see probably actors you hear some of those actors where they're like they don't want to do that type of movie or they want to uh, move out of that type of movie for that reason. They feel like it removes their credibility as an actor or an actress. So mm-hmm. we got that perspective and that was really refreshing overall. And then the way it presented it, you know, they 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 kept that intrigue of what is in his head, what is not in his head, what is real, what is not real, literally into the last second of the movie. When you think you know it, uh it's like oh yeah this is all in his head then they they throw something in at the end was like okay maybe not i don't know i'm confused uh <laughs> but overall definitely i agree with george high rewatchability uh just on the performances alone it's a small scale movie but emotionally psychologically just rings so large scale yeah, with, with what we see on there Exactly. So um, definitely, I, I think top three is a good spot for this one over the last uh, mm-hmm. 10 years. Uh, moving into number two, uh, from 2018, we have Shape of Water, uh, which you can find streaming on Amazon Prime slash Freebie. Uh, you know, basically, this revolves around like a mute, lonely woman who works as a cleaner at like a high security government agency and ends up creating a connection with a merman, uh, basically, to describe it. Uh, for this one, we'll start with you. Oh, it's directed by Guillermo del Toro, the man, the yeah, myth. Can't forget that. Can't... Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. He, yeah, He is him. Uh, <laughs> so we'll go with that. We'll start with you, Dan. What are your thoughts on Shape of Water? Yeah, so I love, we all do. We love us some Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. Um, I This felt like one of those movies, I love The Shape of Water. I lo- I'm i so happy that it won, but it felt like one of those ones where I'm like, kind of like they kind of gave it to him because he kind of earned it at the time. Not saying that I wasn't deserving of it, but what I mean by that is Pan's Labyrinth to me is his, that's, yeah. he should, like, it's that's the baby. Yeah. That's his opus. Pan's Labyrinth is one of my favorite movies in the history of cinema is that's how much I love Pan's Labyrinth. The Shape of Water is done so masterfully. And what I love about this movie is that it very much feels like you're underwater. The camera constantly moves. There's no steady shots. And if you go and you rewatch it, the camera constantly moves like you're underwater. It feels like you're sort of floating between scene to scene. You see in the very beginning when every the furniture starts floating up and the camera moves. There's no steady shots in this movie. Michael Shannon's villain. I love it. And it's the little idiosyncrasies they add where he's addicted to the candy. Or when he goes to pee, he washes his hands first. And I remember he's asked about that and he says, we're either going to wash your hands before or after. But if you do it twice, then that just makes you like a psycho. Like that just makes you nuts. <laughs> so to him, his thing is, well, people are dirty. My junk is not dirty. It's the people that are dirty. So he's going to wash his hands before he touches himself. And it's those little thoughtful things that just really stick out to you. And Doug Jones is the fish. Like it felt like such an ode 
to um 50s horror like universal monsters like i felt like the creature from the black lagoon that was always my gripe is we're getting wolfman we're getting all these things like why are we not getting creatures of the black lagoon like why are we never seeing the creature of the black lagoon this is the closest thing we've seen as like a reiteration of this that's like a long time like I, I don't even know but um maybe since monster squad i don't know but yeah he did yeah, such a yeah. right <laughs> like he did such a good job though with this and it's such an ode to old hollywood was where they had them dancing and they break the surrealism between the characters where you know they're doing uh, the whole like ballet dancing and stuff and it sets like the old 19 like 50s or 30s like old hollywood so this is one that i completely understood what this is a movie that I'm talking about that's catered towards Oscars, which is I understand why it won and all that stuff. But Guillermo del Toro, I'm so happy that he won because it helps legitimizes his career in, in film because you have some people that may win and some people can argue, oh, it's just because, you know, they want to see color win or whatnot. Guillermo del Toro should never be referenced in that. The man is literally that really talented. Like this man is worthy to be on the echelon of filmmakers and The Shape of Water is such a beautifully well-crafted, technically sound movie that even if the subject matter is not your favorite, even though I, I really love the main character, you know, I thought they did such a good job with her, but it's so well-crafted that you can't help but at least appreciate the filmmaking for it. You had such a phenomenal villain, but even the 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 main woman and like her neighbor, like there's just you know the artist, there's just it, it's just it's so good. I I feel like I can keep talking, but I, I'll give it over to you guys. Go ahead, George. What do you? Yeah, I gotta say, like you pretty much like stole most of the the words <laughs> out of my brain there, man. Uh, <laughs> I almost feel like for me that there's I'm I'll be repeating what you said and a lot of myself when I used to go work at Famous Monsters. I had a whole episode where we talked just about this this movie. Mm. Uh, this this was one of my favorite films that had come out during that year. And it's one of my favorite films still. We we had conversations of like, what's a perfect film? And I said, there's no such thing as a 10. And then we got me thinking, it's like, oh, wait, this is a 10. This is a perfect movie. This mm -hmm. is this was a love letter to the to everything I was raised on. You know, I grew up on black and white films of like Shirley Temple stuff and Lon Chaney and the classic Universal Monsters like that's that's what I knew growing up and so seeing this I was like this is this is everything this is everything yeah. it's like he gets it and that at that time I want to say the same year or within that same two years we had just got the mummy with Tom Cruise you know we were supposed to have the dark universe and all that kind of stuff and it failed and then this came out and it's like this is it this is what you're supposed to be making Universal are you taking notes? Are you, you know? Seriously, yeah. Because I, I loved it so much, and just I loved take like having like Sally Hawkins' character. She was silent. She doesn't say a word to the whole movie, but yet she speaks so loudly with everything she does and and how her character moves, the little things she does. Like I, I love the little thing with her sharing the egg with loved the creature. It. You, you know, it, which yeah. that's I don't care. Like they probably named him Amphibian Man. He's the creature. That's it. Yeah, I don't yeah. care. You know, and there's no one else but Doug Jones who could have mm -hmm. been the creature. Mm -hmm. You know, there's probably loads of great stunt men and women and character actors who just wear makeup, but he is the one. He is the epitome of that. This man deserves an Oscar as an actor. He's an actor. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a disgrace that people see him as just like something else, you know, as yeah. like a stunt person like or whatever. Or yeah, it's like, no, he isn't. He's such an actor. It's like he deserves all the accolades for what mm -hmm. he brings to, to something like this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just, yeah, I, I love this movie so much. Every, everything you said, it's, it's point you're dead on. You, yeah. <laughs> Everyone has to watch this film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the one where I got to be the downer. Uh, I don't want to hear Jose. Let's keep on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, I had this ranked low. Uh, how low? Overall. How low? Yeah. Uh, how low? It, it was in my bottom three. Oh, oh you had over this. Damn. Yeah, it, it, it was in my bottom three. Um, this movie, it shows all the strengths of Guillermo del Toro. It's visually stunning, great practical effects. Uh, you know, another solid like creature, creature creation by del Toro. Uh, you know, there's not one part of this movie that's ugly if, if that makes sense everything mm -hmm. um you could tell there was 
like heart and soul put into how this movie looked. Uh, so it plays into all Guillermo's strengths. This movie also plays into his weakness and it's when it comes to the writing. Um, and I remember I was watching it, I was enjoying it. And then once I got to the third act, there was too many plot things and too many character decisions that didn't make sense in the writing that it took me out of the movie and removed some of the enjoyment that I was having during that time. Um, you know, like for example, the bathroom scene, like, yes, visually it looked beautiful, but then I couldn't get out of my head. I'm like, that's that that can't happen. Uh, either that floor is collapsing, that's not filling up perfectly like that the whole time. So then uh, that like took me out. And then the fact that it was like the waiting for a deadline to drop him off. Like you can't drive to the ocean like at any point. If he's in danger and they're searching for him and you, you're like, oh, I want to help him escape. You can literally do that at any point. You don't have to wait for that dock to fill up, fill up. So then that was kind of like that. It was a writing decision made for the fact of making them spend extra time together, mm. not because it made sense. And then the whole thing with the with the spy, you know, the Americans, they were going to kill the creature so that they can study him. They weren't going to keep the creature alive. They were going to kill him. Uh, so the Russians' response is to risk exposing their spy uh, and do what the Americans were already going to do and kill the creature. What do you think the Americans are going to do at that point? They're just going to study the dead body, which was their original intention. So the whole Russian plan made no sense at all, except it was going to expose their spy. So those little writing like tidbits where it was like, this was written in to make the story go, but it didn't really make sense on a character basis. So again, this movie was the good and the bad of Guillermo all in one. Um, I am glad that it won just because, like you said, Guillermo deserves that accolade for mm -hmm. everything that he's done. But this movie itself, it's not up there for one of my favorite Guillermo movies. Visually, it's amazing. So even with this one, it, you have Michael Shannon with the rotting fingers, right? Because it's always, yeah. which is so genius. That's what you're supposed to do as a filmmaker is show the physical to also be in comparison with how they're feeling internally, the external with the internal. And Del Toro did that, man. Yeah. Shout out, yeah. Michael. Michael that, that was a good aspect of it, at least the way I took it in that movie was the fact is uh, the difference of the effect of the injuries that the creature gave. You know, when he injured Shannon, he began to rot in that spot. When he injured the old man, he began to heal. Uh, so it's the difference of like how he's injured. That was a good addition. I will give yeah. it that. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Cool. And then we come down to the number one, which was actually was universally high on all our list. Everyone yeah. had it at either one or two. Is from 2020. We have parasites. Uh, this can be found on Hulu. Uh, the director is Bong Yong Ho. Uh, also known for The Host and Snowpiercer, two other really good movies. Uh, basically, the premise of this is you have a family that like cleverly schemes their way into working for a wealthy family. Uh, they infiltrate their household, earning their trust, even though they have no real qualifications for the jobs that they're doing. Um, and then just chaos, fun chaos ensues after that. Uh, so we'll start with you on this one, George. What's your thoughts on Parasite? Uh, I'm not surprised that this was our number one collectively. I actually kind of anticipated it. Who had it sec? Who had it second? And what do they have as one? I'm curious. For me, this I was number. As... Oh, you know what? This for me, this was number two. Oh, which one did you have? One Shape of Water. Shape of Water. Yeah. Oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. George is okay, the the outlier on this. Yeah, one yeah. Had but it. I had it at number two. It's like it, no, it, it, I, this, I totally get it. it. This was sense. hard. This was very okay. hard. Uh, I do remember in 2020, this was a, a, a film that. Again, I remember talking to like my old FM crew, and this this was just a masterpiece film. You know, I watched this I, like I, at our art house theater. Yeah. <laughs> I completely get why you chose Shape of Water over this one because of what he spoke to you from the you know the the, yeah. the Universal Monster. So exactly, you know what my last, job I was. I worked for a monster yeah. company. I, I <laughs> totally get. It. That's what I'm saying. I completely understand it. Yeah, then. yeah. But this was a freaking a phenomenal yeah. film. Like, like I think of all of 
Jun Ho's movies, this is probably one of my favorite films he's ever made. Honestly. Oh yeah, by far. Yeah, by far. Like, I I I loved seeing how this family one by one slowly crept their way into this elite ho- household. It, one by one, like the, the the son just tutoring the daughter, and then they're like, "Wait, they're they rich? Okay, I think you can get me in there, and like I could be their housekeeper. Well, well I, I I could be his driver. You, you know, like, <laughs> it's just like little by little. It's like I love like how they just live up to the name of the movie. Yeah, it was just so cool because <laughs> yeah. initially when I first saw the the thing for this the trailer, I thought there was going to be something else to it. Mm-hmm. You know, like I wasn't sure. I was, maybe the rich family was going to be bad. Maybe there was. Like, eventually the father gets trapped behind the walls and it's like okay maybe there's a creature maybe there is a real parasite it's like oh no them they are the monster <laughs> they are it <laughs> the leeches yeah <laughs> yeah and i i was just so like and the, the main he's not the main actor but the guy who plays the father uh freaking what's his name uh song hang ho mm-hmm. this guy is in a lot of his movies mm-hmm. and them paired together i almost feel like if they're gonna work together it's gonna be good like mm-hmm. there's there's no way it's gonna yeah. fail and i i love watching him and everything he does he does a really good job of playing almost like as a zaniness even though this character was a little bit more uh refrained and controlled there's mm-hmm. still a, sl- a slight bit of zaniness behind him compared to the rest of the family oh absolutely, you know? absolutely <laughs> yeah those yeah. oh, are good good points george uh i mean like I said, <laughs> I had this number one too, so of course I did love this movie, uh, and I have seen it multiple times. I probably will watch it multiple times more. Overall, um, it's just so like dark, tense, and funny. Uh, like dark, the dark humor is on display in this one, and it's so well done and so subtle at times that it doesn't. It, they don't marvel it up where like the comedy completely overtakes a scene. Uh, you know, at times. This, it just kind of blends in very well. Uh, the good contrast between the two lifestyles of, you know, the wealthy family and the poor, uh, you know, when you see them. And again, this is another thing of like that dark humor. But like at, at the beginning, of course, the wealthy, they're living fine in their house. But then you see the poor family and they're like fumigating outside and they're just like, quick open the window let's get some free fumigation and they're literally passing out and getting sick in the fog just because they're so poor that they need to take advantage of this free fumigation one of those things where it's funny but it's also like oh man like that sucks (laughs) aspect of it uh so that was really well done and i think i like the way it shows like uh you know this rich family was so lost in their comfort that they and their underestimating of the poor kind of leaves them vulnerable to this like cunning family, uh, you know, that's used to surviving and using their cunningness and their survivor skills to infiltrate this home just because the rich was so comfortable that they didn't think much of them or even have the paranoia of like, oh, what if these people are trying to do something? They were just so um, accepting and gullible. Uh, overall uh, and i think they paint, it painted a good picture of that uh what about you dan we'll end with you yeah so i thought i agree i think this is host best film it's 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 kind of how i felt with uh with Guillermo del toro when i saw pan's labyrinth where even though it was so early in their careers because you know Ho's going to come out with a lot more movies it was just so perfect it's really hard for me to see them being able to hit this level again they're going to come out with great stuff, no doubt, but it's just going to be extremely difficult. Parasite was so good. I didn't really know much about it. I just know he was directing it. Um, I'm a huge fan of this type of movies. I'm so glad that uh, Koreans, just Asian Americans, or just Asians in general, are starting to get like a spotlight on their films because I've been a huge fan of Japanese movies for a long time. And um, with this one, when I heard Parasite, I thought it had some maybe some kind of sci-fi element and stuff to it. I really didn't know when I found out that they that they were the the, the parasites as I was watching the film. I thought it was just so clever. And when you show the parallelism that you guys have mentioned between the the wealthy and the not, and how even with with the with the the non wealthy, how there's physical things about them that you know that they're of lower class. For instance, they can literally smell the father. Remember, what's that smell? They can physically smell him 
because of that's how low class he is. And even when you see like their their dwelling is filling up with water, right? And there's only that one little corner that they have to steal the neighbor's Wi-Fi from just to be able to use it. Like it felt very much like roaches. It made them feel like roaches where they're sort of flooding out and they're fumigating, you know, the place like just like they were fumigating outside. They were fumigating the inside of their place too with the water. And when the son gets that good luck statue and that's what's used on him, it's just, it's so done masterfully. And I, I'm a sucker for sad endings in a way. And this one, <laughs> when they set it up, like it was good, but then you see the harsh reality of it at the end that it wasn't. And it was just like in his head, I'm just like, Oh my God, I loved the ending. I loved the ending. And it's just, I can't speak, you know, so well. I can't speak enough how well this movie was. I'm so thankful that it won. That it's one of those movies that, like this one, when Birdman won, it helped, it's sort of gratifying in a way where I'm like, all right, Oscars, you got one right. You got one right. It didn't hold you back that it was a non-English movie. You still went out and you still, like, gave it the Oscar love that it deserved because it was by far the best movie of that year. And it's one of my favorite movies of the last decade, to be honest. Like, easily top five. I love this movie. I've gone back to rewatch it so many times. The acting's superb in this. It's just so good, man. It's so good. And even when uh, the end, you know, when when all the drama and stuff happens and, you know, the gunshots and, like, you know, his wife, his daughter and all. Oh, so heart-wrenching, man. And, like, you're cheering on the villains, they're villainous. They're, they're completely yeah. taking advantage of this family, but you want them to get away with it. It's just, it's so good. So good. So well done. So well yeah. done. Can I say th that movie proves why there shouldn't be an international section anymore Correct. in the Oscars. It yes. should just be global at the end. That's it. Best movie, period. All, yes. all around the board. Yep. Because okay. when they did that for animated movie, it automatically removed animated movie from ever being able to win that. Yeah, and if they do the international, they're doing the exact same thing. Okay, so of the movies that are coming out, real quick, which one are you guys cheering on for this next round of Oscars? What movie would you like to see win? I don't even know who's nominated. So everything, you... everywhere, all at once. That's the movie that I'm cheering on. I hope it wins. Oh, I'm yeah. huge yeah. fan of everything, yeah. everywhere, all at once. You know, uh, it's it's done so well. It, it reminds me sort of like what they did with um, like Birdman. It reminds me of Birdman, where it's so out there, it's so zany. But it still has such a great storyline, and they play a lot with surrealism in this movie. And hot dog fingers, come on, man. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis, <laughs> like Jamie Lee Curtis is so good in this movie. But Michelle, you did so good in this. Like, man, everything everywhere, all at once. The Daniels, huge fan of them. They were the ones that did uh Swiss Army Man, yep. Jose. So uh they were good, man. I, I just found out this morning they're also the ones that directed that music video, turned down for what? You guys ever see that one? That little John oh, one? Oh, snap. Really? That was them. I didn't even know that. It didn't makes total know. sense. Ah, That's what I said. It makes total like, sense. That makes total sense. No <laughs> wonder that music video is amazing. But, dude, the Daniels, man. I hope they get it. I don't know if they are, but I hope they get it. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. I don't even want to look up the list of whoever is against them because I mm -hmm. agree. Like, we've talked about in the past. I love that movie. That yeah. is my new big trouble in Little yeah. China. It is, yeah, it's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, but because they think it could be the Fableman, which is the Spielberg one. You know, yeah. I saw that one. Uh, that one had the whale. It could be the whale, but I'm really hearing the. It might be Fableman, is what I'm hearing. That, that might end up winning. I saw the Fableman. Felt very Oscar baity. It was good, solid, but everything, every all at once is so unique, man. It's so different. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go. With, I looked at the list now. I will have to agree and go with that one. Yeah, you saw it, right, Jose? You saw? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. But, okay. On that note, thank you for watching another episode. Please let us know what uh, how you agree with us. What was your favorite the last 10 years? What movie that you hope that wins this year's in the Oscars? Do you guys still watch it? Let us know in the comment section. You can uh, please like, subscribe, comment, share on our YouTube channel, Not A Strong Start. You can listen to us to anywhere you get to listen to your podcast. You can follow us on Instagram or Twitter, Not A Strong Start. I'm your host, 12 Years of Dan. You can follow me at King underscore Sangre. Um, shape of my burn man. You can follow me at This Is Me Nombre on IG. <laughs> Sounds so dirty. Yeah, I am does. Parasite J. You can follow me at Nicolopolis. <laughs> I know, Shape of My uh, Bird Man. That's going to get us flagged. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>